Here we have, I'm going to read you from a um, document written in 1923, uh, critical of the parliament as it was functioning in Germany at that time. This was the period of the Weimar Republic. Uh, those of you who know your history know it came to a, a, a unfortunate end with uh, uh, Nazism. But um, it was uh, a constant, the Weimar Constitution was written by really the leading political minds, famous social theorists like Max Weber, for example, um, Fernand Paternes and others, uh, in Germany at that, and in Austria during those, that period. It was thought to be quite a vibrant constitution and a vibrant parliament. It didn't work out too well. Here's a critique of it. <clears throat> in numerous brochures and newspaper articles, the most prominent deficiencies and mistakes of the parliamentary enterprise have been pointed out. The dominance of parties, their unprofessional politics of personality, continuing governmental crises, purposeless and the purposelessness and banality of parliamentary debate, the declining standard of parliamentary customs, the destructive methods of parliamentary obstruction, the misuse of parliamentary immunities and privileges by a radical opposition which is contemptuous of parliamentarianism itself. And it goes on in this vein. Well, uh, that rings too true, not just of parliament in Germany in the 1920s, but of uh, parliaments really all over the world. There's a lesson to be learned from this. Do you care to guess who the author of this condemnation of parliamentarianism was? Herman Hesse? Pardon? Herman Hesse? Nope. Uh-oh. That's Stephen a good Hoffa. guess, but no. Oh. Pardon? Stephen Hoffa. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's more grotesque than uh, you can imagine. Um, this was written by one of the leading uh, legal theorists of Germany at the time. Uh, I hate to say it, but actually quite a brilliant author, and also a card-carrying member of the National Socialist Party at the time, a Nazi. Karl Schmidt is his name. He's a critic of parliamentarianism. He thought that parliaments and parliamentary democracy was bound to come to this. It wasn't just the accident of having uh, misguided or crooked or uh, egotistical uh, or incompetent members of parliament or leaders of uh, a government. It was endemic to parliamentarianism and to parliaments themselves. And they were bound to come to this because they had to be fractious of their very nature. So what Schmidt advocated was a uh, form of, he wanted to call it democracy, uh, which was entirely unitary. And uh, he thought that either Bolshevism or fascism might do the trick. He himself favored fascism. Now, there is a lesson to be learned because a lot of people were attracted to Schmidt's views. And a lot of people were attracted to the fascist alternative that uh, Schmidt held out to them because his criticisms of parliamentarianism as it was functioning at the time rang true. So what lesson can you take from that? Well, one lesson you can take, of course, is, Sch is Schmidt's lesson, and that is that this is the nature of parliaments and parliamentary democracy itself. The other lesson that you can take from it, however, was that the behavior of the German members of parliament and the functioning of that Weimar parliament brought disgrace and discredit to parliamentarianism itself, thus opening the door to totalitarianism. That's the lesson that I draw from it. And it's a lesson that um, applies to us today. I'm not suggesting that we are confronted with the prospects of a fascist Canada. Um, however, it does seem to me that certain in Parliament, and in particular, the leader of the government, Harburg, have discredited parliamentarianism. 
they brought disrepute to the house. And if you ask people generally, if you look at the newspaper, you know, the letters to the editor and the columns and so on, you can see that, that people have a very low opinion of Parliament. Uh, they do think that there's something uh, misguided, wrong, um, chaotic, undemocratic about it. And that's bringing disrepute to Canadian parliamentarianism. Should we care? Well, I'm going to address this uh, comment as a democratic theorist. I'm glad you introduced me as a theorist. It's wonderful to be a theorist. Facts, who cares? <laughs> They're not my domain. <laughs> I'm not a political scientist, for Christ's sakes. I'm a theorist. <laughs> so I'm going to speak theoretically about this. I, haven't, I have looked a bit at some of the history of prorogations around the world. Um, Canada has, has prorogued its parliament uh, three times, twice under Harper. Anyone know who first prorogued parliament the first time? Was that Mackenzie King? It was Mackenzie King. In 1873, he was, there was a scandal going on. He, he had been caught, his government had been caught uh, giving a contract to a railway company to build the Pacific uh, a wing of the rail, Trans-Canada Railway in exchange for something like $400,000 of campaign donations to the, to the Conservative Party. Uh, and it, this enraged the opposition and it certainly enraged the populace. So uh, Mackenzie, uh, 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 John A. Macdonald was in for, the founder of Canada, uh, was in for, uh, you know, uh, some rough times and he solved the problem the same way Harper did by provoking Parliament. It didn't do him any good. We can hard, take heart from this maybe. Uh, when Parliament came back in, people were, were then put off because he prorogued it, as well as the fact that he was extending these bribes and uh, he was forced to resign. Uh, and, his, and the party, the Conservative Party, was defeated. Well, let me come at it now, however, from the point of view of democratic theory. And I'll begin by flagging a dilemma a very serious theoretical problem with practical implications, to be sure, for, uh, for democracy itself. Because, you see, democracy requires that the people rule popular sovereignty. Demos, the people, rule. Lucrezia, ruled by the people, that the people govern themselves. But on the other hand, the people literally cannot rule. For there to be democracy, the people must rule, but the people, as a people, cannot rule. Why is that? Because there's no such thing as a people. It just doesn't exist. There are peoples, uh, there are lots of individuals who can make collective decisions and see themselves as part of a collective. But when it comes, for example, to uh, an election, but also in small groups where people are striving to reach consensus, who are even working on a participatory democratic model, people will come into a process, whether it's one of, of an election with votes, uh, or whether it's in a deliberative forum where people are interacting with one another, striving to come to consensus, people will come into those forums, into those processes, with different views with different ideas about what the outcome should be. Sometimes they can win one another over to a common view in the end, but that's fairly rare. Uh, but even when they do, they don't come into it as a people. Uh, it's, the, it's demagogues who claim to speak for the people. American politicians who, uh, who, who reside in a country which is famous or infamous for multiple fractious conflict of all sorts between their two major parties and within all of them, the states, the federal government, within the states, within the federal government, 